I'm SP from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a show about the general Marvel comic universe, part of the Guinea Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other hilarious and fun geeky shows at guineageeknetwork.com. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven, Chris, and SP. Welcome to an all new episode of the official Gunna Geek show. I am Steven and with me, of course, is Chris Farrell. Sup, dudes. Sup, dudes, indeed. You know what else is sup, dudes? SP. Woo! It's Monday. It's Monday night. We get to podcast. It's going to be a fun night. Matter of fact, I heard a rumor that this is going to be the best show ever. All right, let's start off with a smart home story. Uh, this is this is a great story that I think SP should share with everybody because today he sent us a little bit of a video, um, but the story itself is actually better because there's no video being played for, for today's show. But I want you to go ahead and tell everybody about your smart home story. I like it. Yesterday, I was recording Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., but also earlier in the day, I got a notification that my new range hood was being delivered. Now, I know I haven't talked about this on the podcast before, but my oven, part of my range, which was installed when the house was built in 2003, went kibosh a couple of weeks ago. So I scurried out and started shopping for a new range, which is the stovetop and the oven in the middle of an appliance shortage. In the pandemic, it was a thing about shipping and creation, uh, development and manufacturing and shipping and parts availability and stuff like that. Hey, I won't bore everybody to the things. It's just I need an oven. I, I don't have an oven right now and I need an oven. So I went out and I shopped around and I bought a new range. Now, the old range is white and the range hood is white. You can't really get white appliances anymore. So I decided to go to black stainless. So I decided to get a black stainless range. And I came home and I looked at the old range, the white range. And then I looked up at the range hood and said, hmm, that's white. That's not going to work. So I went online again and I started looking for a new range hood. I finally found one, uh, coincidentally, at the same place that I bought the actual range from different brands, but that doesn't matter. As long as it looks decent together, that's going to be good. And I ordered it online and I had it shipped to my house thinking it would show up on a regular day or a Saturday at the very least. Well, no, it decides to show up on Sunday while I'm recording the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. The problem is I've got this new appliance in just a cardboard box and it is pouring rain. And I'm looking at my surveillance cameras because I got the email notification that it was going to come and the text notifications that it was going to come. FedEx delivered it. And so I see the FedEx truck pull up to my house going, oh, crap, I'm in the middle of recording Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. So what am I supposed to do? So I go to my MyQ app and I open it up. It takes a couple seconds to open up. But that's OK. The FedEx guy is getting this giant box with this range in it. And I see my button on my queue saying double garage door uh, closed. So I opened it. And luckily enough, the FedEx guy had two wits about him and decides to bring it in to the garage. Now, the bonus is I do have a ring camera in my garage. So I watch him bring it into the garage and I watch him bring it far enough into the garage that I can actually close the garage door and I don't have to worry about rain whipping in. So as soon as he leaves, while I'm podcasting, by the way, while I'm podcasting, I do not leave this seat. I close the garage door, FedEx guy leaves, and I have a nice dry package with my new range hood. So smart home cameras and garage door save the day while I'm podcasting. I thought it was kind of neat. And Steven, as soon as I sent it, said, oh, my gosh, SP, you got to talk about this. This is awesome. I love this story. Yes, I think this was a fantastic story, SP, and I'm so glad you shared it because this is this is smart home tech to the rescue. 
combined with laziness, which meant you didn't have to get out of your chair. So like, you know, you put these two things together, not having to stand up, being able to have the smart home solve the problem. And that's a Stephen John Drew story that he can get behind. Is it really laziness? I mean, we've seen so many Zoom calls or work calls or whatever over the past year where people are trying to get work done or news interviews or whatever from their home and their kid walks in the room or the dog starts barking or somebody comes to the door and they have to get up and leave and take care of it. I didn't have to do that. It's not laziness. It's I was recording a podcast and I got to continue recording the podcast and I also accepted delivery of this new range hood. All I got to say is that uh, I am so glad that you were home on the range hood. Oh. You've been holding on that for a couple of days, haven't you? And 15 minutes during an edit point that nobody else uh, heard about that's watching this in the post show, which is why you should come live to geeks.live if you want to see all of the magic happen on Sundays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at geeks. You, you mean live. Mondays. Mondays. What did I say? Sun- Sunday. Sundays, Mondays, same difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's kick it all off with a a wonderful piece of news. This is this here has me super excited because there is something that always grinds my gears and it's trying to actually figure out what review is real. Go ahead, Chris Farrell. That's true. It is always difficult being able to tell what review is real and fake spot can only do such a good job. But if you were on Amazon.com today and you were looking for something like, I don't know, an inexpensive new phone charger, USB cables, maybe some webcams or some cheap USB microphone, things like that, you might have noticed that selection was a bit more limited than the pandemic would have normally be. Yeah, there's a reason for that. There was a bunch of stuff that was delisted, some temporarily and some still as we record this, from Amazon.com. You might be wondering, well, why is this the case? Well, here's what happened Today, Uncovered was a fake review, not pyramid scheme, but kind of payment plan that was going on. So Amazon removed a bunch of things from their stores, like individuals have stores like, say, Vendor X has their marketplace, things like that. These a lot of these were all shut down and their products are no longer purchasable because, you know, fake reviews is a violation of the terms of service to sell through Amazon. That's the problem we have today. Uh, Online safety advocate Safety Detective uncovered a massive trove of data pointing to a wide-reaching pay-for-play review system reportedly focused on China-based phone and computer accessory companies that sell on Amazon. This leak exposed a system of companies paying to generate real-looking but completely falsified reviews for new products. So what was their goal here? Shoot up the Amazon rankings for having a high number of positive reviews, with a good rating, and that starts the water wheel of purchases and real reviews after that. The system would basically have third-party companies buy products, then submit favorable five-star reviews from fake user accounts. They were then reimbursed for these products, and then a little bit extra, of course, via a separate payment platform to protect the integrity of the verified purchase markings that you see in Amazon reviews. The leak that was found by Safety Detective shows over 75,000 Amazon accounts being used for this for the services, although at this time, the true scale of this has not been uncovered and is not yet known. One thing to keep in mind, it isn't clear how complicit the product selling companies were in the system, but it'd be hard to imagine that they weren't aware of something going on to cause massive numbers of positive views to show up spontaneously. If you want to be charitable, you could say that There might have been people external to the company that were trying to pump up these brands, but it seems kind of unlikely. So one of the things that was surprising to me, I read this news story, I want to say probably about 3.30, 4 o'clock this afternoon. I went on Amazon. I was like, let's look and see what, what vendors I might recognize that aren't on there anymore. And one of the vendors that I could not purchase anything for is a vendor I've had good experiences with. I've bought USB-C cables from them. I use them for Android Auto in my car right now. I've bought USB battery packs from them before. Nothing crazy expensive or anything like that, but just basic accessories. That's a company called Aukey, A-U-K-E-Y. And I'm sure a bunch of folks who are watching this, if you buy cables and stuff like that, you've probably heard of them because they generally have a wide selection of USB cables for cell phones, computers, things like that, all sorts of stuff. 
I was really surprised that they were delisted for a while. You went on Amazon's site, even their storefront was gone. Now, as we record this on May 10th, it's about 9.15 p.m. Eastern, right before the show, I popped on there to see if the Aki storefront was back. It was back. However, I could not purchase anything in the storefront and not all items in the storefront showed up. And when you found a listing for something like, say, a USB-C power adapter sold by Aki, it would just say currently unavailable. So it appears that Amazon has cracked down on some of these folks that are presumably involved in a review scheme and have basically said, yep, you can't sell through us right now. And I'm sure we'll see more shake out. Now, what has been interesting is some other companies that I've purchased stuff through before. That's uh, Anchor, A-N-K-E-R. You guys have probably heard of them. Mm -hmm. Also, USB cables and battery packs. And Rav Power, same thing. USB cables and battery packs I've bought through them. And I think Anchor, you can actually buy in Target stores now, like brick and mortar stores. I think they have a presence Mm -hmm. there. These companies have not been delisted. There has been no indication from Safety Detective or anyone else investigating this leak that those two companies were involved. But who knows at this point in time, we may find out something later down the road and see them get delisted. Just be wary. I mean, we've always known that some of these exclusively Chinese companies that sell cables for cheap, it seemed very suspicious when they'd launch a product and you'd automatically have like a thousand plus five star reviews. And you're like, yeah, this just came out like a week ago. How did this happen? And there are sites, like I mentioned, fake spot that try and do a good job of uncovering fake reviews. But these guys had set up quite the system here and Amazon cracked down on them hard. And I'm very interested to see whether Aki, for instance, gets listed again in the store. Steven's right there with an Aki power yeah. adapter. And funny story. So this power adapter that I'm holding is a 60 watt USB-C for something that I was I was trying. And um, yeah, I literally just bought it like two weeks ago. And and I, I just as you were talking about this, I pulled it up my history. Right. And I clicked on mm-hmm. the item mm-hmm. and. And there's a wonderful picture of a dog saying, sorry, yep. we couldn't yep. fetch that page. So yeah, sure enough, even on .ca, pulled on down, Amazon.ca also affected. And so here's the thing we should clarif- clarify real quick. I bought Aki products and I've never had a problem. No. But one time I got a cable that was faulty and I asked to return it and they said, hey, we'll make it right. We'll send you just because it was a two pack. They sent me another two pack of cables and said, we want to make it right. I was like, okay, fine by me. I tossed out the dead cable, and then I had three cables. So I've never had a problem with them in this instance. So in the last half a year, I bought two Aki chargers. One was an 18-watt, one was a 20-watt, I believe, USB-C for the 20. Yeah, they were both 20-watt, or or USB-C chargers. So I I go to them, and I get the page. Sorry, we couldn't find that page. Now, Steven, I'm, I'm wondering... What are the names of your dogs? Because these are the dogs of Amazon. I got Ari, A-E-R-I, and I got Mischief. So what dog or dogs did you get when you were looking oh, for I, your Aki? I closed the tab. I yeah, closed of course the tab. you did. Um, I was trying to get in, but you just overran, and I couldn't say anything in time. Just, oh, where is it here? Okay, I just quickly go through history. Here we go. Okay, right now I have Ike. I have Ike. I don't Ike. know which one I had before. Now I have Robin. Uh, now I have Eli and okay. Rocket. No, I can't find the one I had. Rocket? Sorry. Did Rocket have a gun? Uh, no, I have Mila and Barney. Okay. This is just what we're going to do the rest of the show is just refresh our 404 pages and read <laughs> out the dogs. <laughs> the dogs of Amazon. Yeah, this one's this, Kodak I, for my 63 watt charger that I bought from them at one point in time. <laughs> I so, think this is great because, you know, when you're looking at these things, Throughout the past year and a half, we've done a lot more shopping online than we have in the past. I've even bought sewing machines online where I would have normally gone into the store to buy them. And it's always funny because you get a couple of verified users. And I always thought the verified thing was something that was not a gold standard, but it was like, okay, if somebody's going to buy this expensive thing then it's probably not going to be a fake review. But I was reading the review going, this cannot be true. This can't be true. So I've devalued the amount of reviews and the veracity of these reviews over time and just going off of generalities of people that I trust to talk to them about how did you like this? Because the online reviews are meaningless now. And this is proving the case that It is a click farm, basically, that's doing this, and they're getting reimbursed not only for the article to solidify that verified purchase, but a little kickback for their time and trouble. Well, the last thing that I want to throw in about this is that this just 
perfectly summarizes the golden rule that I usually have with anything online, which is that you don't trust verified. It's a golden blanket rule that I have there. Don't mm-hmm. trust anything or anyone that is verified. We're looking at you, Twitter. Cody. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Cody Goff. Thanks for spelling that out, Chris. I appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't want there to be any open interpretation there that you might be calling out anyone else. We're after you, Cody. We're after you. All right. Well, thanks for keeping us up to date with that there. And uh, yeah, this is actually a really interesting thing to follow. Moving on to the next news story here. It's looking like it's going to be a while till you're going to get regular supply of PlayStation 5. Yes, during a call with financial analysts, Sony warned that it now expects PlayStation 5 availability problems to continue through to the end of 2022, not 2021. They think it's going to carry through to the end of 2022. Sony privately briefed a group of analysts on the PlayStation 5 supply after the company reported its quarterly earnings at the end of April. This is according to Bloomberg. Allegedly, Sony's chief financial officer has said that the company's PS5 supply cannot meet demand this year or next year. Quote, I don't think demand is calming down this year. And even if we secure a lot more devices and produce many more units of the PlayStation 5 next year, our supply wouldn't be able to catch up with demand. He, he went on to say, quote, we have sold more than 100 million units of, play, of the PlayStation 4 and considering our market share and reputation, I can't imagine demand dropping easily, end quote. That was the quote that was in there. I don't know if they're crediting Pat. Anyways, we'll leave that at there. The bottom line is that there are two main problems that Sony is facing with production. Number one, the high demand because people really want it. Number two, the fact that there is that continued internal components slowing down the process, basically a lack of availability So therefore, your manufacturing is delayed. This is something that SP briefly talked about a few weeks ago is the the chip problem that the world is facing. And Sony is no different here. And it looks like internal components are continuing to slow down the production process. So it looks like we're going to be a while till we have demand uh, be able to be easily met. And I suspect, although this is a Sony story, I suspect we'll continue to see the same thing on the Microsoft side as well which might be a good indicator of why Microsoft is primed right now to really make that X cloud work. Like, come on, like this, this, it's right there, right there. This is, this is almost the perfect storm for them if they could get it to work. But they need those chips for X cloud too, because all That's the X cloud stuff is basically an Xbox one S right now, which is kind of slow in the grand scheme of things. It is serviceable and does what it needs to, but Uh, Like you mentioned, this is a problem that's across the board. There's stories coming from the Microsoft side of the house where a couple months ago they were saying they expected delays to last until June of this year. They have revised those estimates a little further out at this point in time. But right now, I think they're all just kind of spitballing and saying, well, assuming chip production starts up to what we expected, we'll be caught up at this point. Even Nintendo's getting hit with it, supposedly, where they are not able to put near as many Switch consoles out right now and there's been a lot of demand for the switch in the middle of the pandemic so this is just another sign of all this cool tech that we want it's tough to get because they can't manufacture the chips fast enough it's a problem i just feel really really bad because i know chris you are so disappointed that you only have a modern console xbox i know that sony is your go-to yeah that's why my whatever the gamer score equivalent on PlayStation Network is like less than 2,000 points. Yeah, I'm sure that's one of your many accounts over there. We know how much you play Sony PlayStation. I did actually turn my PlayStation on because the power went out and I need to turn it back on to download an update. (laughs) (laughs) SP, are you uh, looking forward to getting yourself a PlayStation 5? I am eventually, but I'm not going to play these jacked up prices for any of them and i'm wondering long term if this is going to affect the online gaming services that each of them have i mean if there's less consoles out there there's just going to be inherently a less demand for the current gen or next gen of online gaming services from all these companies that just can't get their stuff out i mean right now it's probably not a big deal but if this persists for another couple of years where supply is so low or it's the costs of these things are so high 
It's just it, people are just going to weigh in into it. You're going to have your core group of gamers. I'll, I'll grant you that. But the wide uh, adaptation of people like me who don't game that often. Yes, I have gamer accounts on both PlayStation and Xbox, and I'm paying for those services. But if I can't get the next generation of consoles, eventually I'm going to be like, oh, well, bye. I'm not playing not, these games play anymore right now, though. <laughs> Well, you know, okay, granted, but eventually I'm just wondering if it's going to be a domino effect like two, three years from now. Well, I look forward to finding out when Chris sells his Xbox because he just gets his PlayStation 5 and just realizes it does everything that he needs. He's not going to sell it. He's going to send it to either you and me. Oh, and right. I'm guessing he's just going to send it to me because those tariffs across the border, they're just so outrageous. So I'm going to get it. Thanks, Chris. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, moving on to the next news story here. What's going on in the world of blue Oregon? Is that what it is? It's it's Oregon. Like the state, the trail, uh, the trail. I was thinking it was Oregon trail. Yes. Might as well be Oregon Trail because we're talking about the pioneering of space tourism here. <laughs> and I put a tweet out. You know, there's a lot of space news that's been happening on a weekly basis. I put another tweet out on the Get a Geek Twitter account. So you want to get your, you know, your two cents in on which news stories that I cover for space every week. Pay attention to that on Sunday and Monday. I sent out a tweet with a, a voting you know, the, the 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 thing that you can have multiple options on and you select one of the options and, and you vote on it and a poll. That's uh, what it's called. Poll. Oh, not the type of poll that I usually find you on 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 Sunday evenings. No, and that's just a private broadcast to you. OK, so, <laughs> yeah, I put a poll out and apparently a lot of people want to hear about Blue Origin. So we're going to talk about Blue Origin. In the past week, Blue Origin announced they are targeting July 20th, 2021, which is the 52nd anniversary of the first crewed lunar landing for the debut astronaut launch of its new Shepard vehicle. The announcement for the flight was on May the 5th, which is the 60th anniversary of Alan Shepard's pioneering 15-minute suborbital flight for the United States in 1961. Of course, the Soviets beat the Americans to the suborbital flight and to the first orbital flight. But this was the first one from the United States. So the new Shepard rocket vehicle is, in fact, named after Alan Shepard. And the planned flight for the July 20th is estimated to be about 10 to 12 minutes long, according to a flight profile graphic posted by New Origin. And that's pretty much equivalent to the 15 minute suborbital flight that Alan Shepard took. New Shepard is capable of carrying up to six people, and Blue Origin announced that one of the six seats on its July 20th flight will be filled by a winner of an online auction. It's going to be a three-phase auction. Get this, guys. Phase one of the auction is online and runs through May 19th. Phase two then shifts to on-sealed online bidding. I don't know exactly what that means, but on-sealed online bidding. That will run until June 12th, which is phase three, it's going to be a live online auction. Now, this is very important because it's probably going to be the only chance for the public to get on board the capsule for the first suborbital flight. And it's also important, as I will discuss later, because nobody knows the price of the tickets to this thing. So who knows what this price is going to be for the sixth seat? Now, according to the description of the event by Blue Origin, quote, the winning bid amount will be donated to Blue Origins Foundation Club for the Future to inspire future generations to pursue careers in STEM and help invent the future of life in space. Now, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. New Shepard has two parts. You have the rocket and the capsule. They're both called New Shepard. The rocket ends up back on Earth with a short powered touchdown after its flight and separation from the capsule. I think all three of us watched that either live or near real-time live with its latest test flight that it had. So it comes down very similar to what you would see a Falcon 9 booster. So the capsule itself lands softly under parachutes and a puff of air that comes out. I, I don't really think the puff of air does anything, but apparently they do, uh, after its suborbital flight. New Shepard has completed 15 on-crewed test flights to date, the latest on April 14th, 2021. That is what I was referring to before that we watched live. New Origin has not announced 
to date what it will charge for a seat. I did go back and I looked over the past week. There was nothing that said that New Origin will charge for a seat. However, there was a lot of uh, comparisons to another company out there, which is charging $250,000 per seat. I don't know if that's going to be it for this because the other company is an airplane. This is an actual rocket. I don't know if the price goes up because of the rocket or are, down. Are, are you matter. comparing to Virgin Galactic? Is that what it is? I may or may not be. Yeah, yes. no, and, and I'm not going to make the joke this time because I'm legitimately that was going to be my question for you. And and I, I vow I will not make Virgin Galactic jokes for this episode uh, because I legitimately wanted to ask this. Virgin Galactic was the one that we were following because of the space tourism. And so when I, I saw this news article here, it kind of made me think, wait, did Blue Origin just like beat them at their game? Because Virgin Galactic was supposed to be the space tourist, what, weren't they? Yes, that other company would have beat I, I said, Blue Origin. I, I will not make you go ahead and say it. I won't make the okay. joke. I, I I I vow not to make the joke. Virgin, I believe Virgin Galactic would have beat Blue Origin to the game here, but they had a couple things against them. First of all, they had the tragic accident that occurred, and then they ran into delays when they were creating and then test flying the new generation of ships. They have a couple of ships ready to go, and they're perilously close to actually having somebody up there. And I believe Branson himself said he's going to be on the first flight that went up. Don't quote me on that. It's just my memory of, of what things are going here on uh, Virgin Galactic. But the pandemic really hit them hard in what they were able to do and what they weren't able to do. It hit everybody hard. I mean, even it hit NASA hard and NASA just concentrated on the big things that it had to do. Like it had a launch window. It had to meet to Mars. So it met those objectives per, for perseverance and insight or uh, ingenuity. And it had certain, th there's orbital mechanics involved for interplanetary bodies that it just had to meet those gates. And then the SLS itself, it had to meet certain gates underneath the older administration, the, uh, the Trump administration. Now the Biden administration, they haven't set a timetable, but Trump administration definitely did. So they they were focused. NASA was focused on that. Virgin Galactic just didn't have a forcing function because who's going to go on a space tourism flight where you're sitting in close proximity to people? You can't really wear a mask. Are you going to self quarantine for 14 days before you do it and that sort of thing? And not that that is mandatory now, but it was mandatory a year ago. So I, I could see how Blue Origin ultimately beat them because gotcha. Blue Origin still persisted in their development and then bingo. And now there's a lot of time still left. There's like a month and a half between or just over a month and a half, just over a month between now and July 20th. They might actually, Virgin Galactic might actually get up there. So I, no. I don't know for sure, but I think Blue Origin is going to beat them. I didn't know that. I, I thought Virgin Galactic was um, still behind qu quite a bit, but I... They, yeah, I haven't been covering him for the very reason that you have said something. And, and to be honest with you, it's just a suborbital flight on a plane. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, we have rockets. Why, what are we talking about these planes for? Uh, so yeah, that's that's the deal there. Okay, to get back to Blue Origin here, uh, Blue Origin has not announced to date what it will charge for a seat. We went over that. Blue Origin also has not announced who will fill the five other seats on board its maiden New Shepard crewed flight. Now, people who do fly on the New Shepard have to meet a number of physical and other conditions. There is a terms that went along with the auction, which you can see. There are functional requirements. Guys, we're going to have fun here. These are the functional requirements to fly on New Shepard. The first one is dress yourself. And Stephen, I'm not sure if you meet that criteria. I think that other people in your household actually dress you every day. I'm not wearing pants because my wife didn't get my outfit together today. See? Well, you don't have to wear pants to podcast. We've had this conversation. In fact, it's encouraged not to. It's a good thing because, again, I have not worn any pants today at all. Good on you. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> You do you, boo. Okay. Uh, number two, able to climb the launch tower, which is equivalent of seven flights of stairs. Not, not to any time. You have to do it in 90 seconds. Chris, I know you work out. You're on the elliptical. You're on the treadmill, or you used to be. 
even in the height of your fitness, if you're not there right now, can do you think you can do seven flights of stairs in 90 seconds? Depends on how monetarily invested I am. In it. <laughs> if I had to bid millions of dollars to do it, you can bet your sweet ass I'm going to be going as fast as I can. <laughs> and I guess it doesn't say how winded you can be when you get up there or how much you have to sweat or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. I, I could do it. I could do it. Uh, I would be puffing a little bit, but I could do it. Okay. Is it Comfort- stairs? Oh, it's not climbing a ladder like on a water tower? Well, this is a disappointment. You can climb the ladder if they let you. <laughs> there is a, there's got to be a safety ladder there for fire purposes. Okay, comfortable with heights to 70 feet above ground level. And I was like, well, why is this? Oh, on a grated gangway. So you get to the top of the tower. You have to go from the tower to the capsule over a grated gangway. But it's basically, you're looking straight down 70 feet. So you got to be comfortable with heights here. And I... I know a lot of people that wouldn't be comfortable with that. I mean, it's 70 feet in the air. Can't, can't you just like make it a little enclosure from the tower to the capsule like they used to do with like the Apollo astronauts? No, you got to walk across this created thing. Okay. You have to, and this is hard for, you know, anybody that um, travels in cars these days, you have to fasten and unfasten your seatbelt into under 15 seconds. I, I don't know. I've been on some planes that this just doesn't happen. It did 15 seconds. It's, People take longer than 15 seconds to buckle their seatbelts. So I w- th- these are interesting conditions that I- I'm kind of amazed at because like you pay enough money. Can you break that 15 seconds? Get Okay. You know, I'll do my seatbelt in like 40 seconds or something like any. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be capable of sitting in the seat for 40 to 90 minutes on the 90 minutes is if there is a, some a launch delay or something like that but you have to sit in a seat for 90 minutes so you can't uh, have to get up and walk around the cabin sort of thing and i know a lot of plane passengers that are frequent flyers and first class that that they wouldn't be able to do that do i get a pee jug i don't know if you can pee in your suit or not honestly. just wear a diaper <laughs> And there's a reason that I don't know this, and we'll get to that in a second. (laughs) Uh, Okay, you have to be 18 years old, which I I am way more than 18 years old, so good. You have to weigh, (laughs) and they made me do some math here. You have to weigh between 50 and 101 kilograms. I was like, okay, so how many pounds is that? You know, I could do a rough estimate in my head, but no, since I'm doing the podcast, I actually went out and did the math. It's between 110 to 222 pounds. So, Stephen, you could not bring, I'm assuming your kids are, are less than 110 pounds. You could not bring your kids on this ride. All right. Well, that's one of the ends of the spectrum that excludes me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you have to be between 152 and 193 centimeters tall, which is roughly five feet to six foot four. You have to be able to withstand three G's of acceleration during the launch, which is about two minutes. Okay, yeah, that's actually not that bad, guys. I've done it before. It's not that bad. You have to be able to withstand 5.5 G's, quote, for a few seconds, unquote, during reentry. This might be a little bit more because they don't say it's positive or negative G's. I'm assuming it's positive. I'm assuming it's positive. If it's negative G's, I'm going to pass out. I'll be honest with you. That's a lot of negative G's there. I mean, fighter aircraft, they're designed, if it's a a piloted fighter aircraft, they're designed to pull 9 to 12 Gs in the positive direction, but you go negative. They're like, the the, the, uh, computerized controls, they do minus 3 Gs, and that's it. They know you're going to pass out beyond that. So 5.5 negative Gs would be a lot. The other thing is you have to understand instructions in English from a ground crew member in an environment where the noise level can reach 100 decibels. And I'm like, ooh, that actually might disqualify me because I don't know if I could disentertain that because I have ear issues. You guys know that, right? So I I don't know if that would be. And then you have to see and respond to alert lights in the capsule. So guys, of those functional requirements, other than the dress yourself thing, what is your favorite? Chris, what is your favorite of that? That's tough. That's tough. I think the seatbelt one just makes me is I'm entertained by. Yeah. Stephen, what is yours besides, you know, the I get to leave my kids at home for this ride one. Uh, the part that I get to pee my own diaper. That that was okay. one of the requirements, right? 
Okay. Well, this is why it's a, that's a good point. So this is why I don't know the answer to that is because in order to do this, you actually have to sign a blue origin non-disclosure agreement. So I think that includes like peeing in suits and stuff like that, because I didn't see that. So you have to sign an NDA. You have to sign an informed consent. You have to sign a waiver of claims. So if something happens to you, you don't, you can't sue them. And you have to sign a standard launch services contract. So, you know, going up in the space tourism, so it's not like buying a ticket to Disney World. You're actually doing training. You got to do all these functional requirements. It's not just like the height requirement for rides at, at a, an amusement park. Like you'd stand up on your tippy toes and you can actually get in. No, these are pretty strict requirements, I think. And it's going to limit the number of people that do this. Now, that all said, we're talking about the cost per seat, and there's guesstimates out there by economists that this would appeal to the 6 million or so people in the world that have a net worth of 5 million or more. So if you had, I guess they're considering if you have a net worth of 5 million, that you could pay 250000 for it, and there's 6 million people in the world that can do that. Oh, I'm glad that I am included in this. That's all those great Tesla stock choices that you made last year, right? Yeah, no. So I, when, when do we get our salary then? That's that's <laughs> how. Yeah, that's how I made my money was by shortchanging you for all these episodes. Hmm. I see, skimming off the pot. <laughs> well, this is interesting. Um, and yes, I will definitely not be doing this because, again, I am I am not rich. I know you're, you're shocked. You're saying, Stephen, you have a hobby podcast that gets like five listeners. I'm shocked, shocked that you you don't have five million dollars. There's nothing that says this auction is going to be won by more than five dollars. It I don't know if there's a minimum. I don't know if there's a reserve. You could win this auction by 10 Canadian dollars, which is like two dollars American. Well, I look forward to finding out how much the person actually paid, which will be a lot more than five dollars. Well, moving on to the next news point here. What's going on with Google foiling Roku's plans? What? Yeah, so go figure. Uh, Roku is not getting along with another person that has an app on their platform right now. Again, shocked. Shocked am I. <laughs> Peacock and HBO Max say hello. Um, <laughs> so a friendly reminder, probably about a year ago or so, I did a tap that app segment where I talked about YouTube TV. I had a generally positive uh, impression on it. And one of the things that I really liked about the fact, or the app rather, was that it was available on pretty much any set-top box I wanted to put it on. Yeah, that that that's not the case anymore. Uh, Google and Roku kind of, they're stuck in the middle of an ongoing feud. So let's go through the current history so we can talk about how Google kind of uh, circumvented some things that they did. So if you had not been paying attention, Roku and Google needed to renew the contract for YouTube TV. That's the TV replacement app I talked about on the Roku platform. The two companies weren't able to come to an agreement on the new contract. This has resulted in YouTube TV being pulled from the Roku store. Now, it's not as bad as it could be yet. If you have already downloaded the YouTube TV app, they are not removing it from your Roku devices yet. However, comma, if you had just signed up for YouTube TV and had not yet installed the YouTube TV app when this uh, contract ran out, you are SOL until we get to what Google just announced on this last Friday in a blog post. They're doing an end around on Roku and what they have done is stick the YouTube TV app directly within the YouTube app that you can download on the Roku right now. YouTube and YouTube TV and YouTube music, those are all things that exist as separate apps. And when the YouTube TV contract expired and the app was taken off, they decide, well, we'll jam it in the YouTube app because that doesn't expire until December with Roku. Uh, since the YouTube app is still up and running and available, they were pretty easily able to basically shove a link in there that opens your YouTube TV content. Now, this is not exactly unheard of here. If you've used the YouTube Music app before, it's pretty much the same thing. It's basically just a version of the YouTube app that takes you directly to music. They're pretty much the exact same thing. Google has said they are still trying to come to an agreement with Roku for their mutual customers, but Google did threaten Roku with further escalation because remember the YouTube app, the deal runs out in December. If they haven't solved it then, then Roku could pull that. 
They said, we're in discussion with other partners to secure free streaming devices in case YouTube TV members face any access issues on Roku. Meaning, if Roku doesn't renew the deal, Google's like, we got plenty of cash. We're going to give everyone Chromecast devices, basically, to ensure that you can still watch YouTube TV. That is my guess to what they are going to do. Uh, A few weeks ago, Google did offer to renew the YouTube TV deal under the existing reasonable terms with Roku. Roku kind of said no. They seem to be the current aggressor. It gets a little fuzzy here. YouTube did the end around on them. Roku's obviously mad about it. More is going to shake out here. But why are these two companies really fighting? Carriage feed disputes is what everyone's talking about right now. They're all saying, oh, it's because Roku wants a certain cut of subscription fees or they want things to get integrated into the Roku app so that you can see YouTube TV content that way. No, I think the real reason for this rift is over Google's AV1 video codec requirements for YouTube, presumably only on new uh, devices going forward. They've pretty much made it mandatory for any device that wants to run the YouTube app from, I want to say, January 1 of this year, any new device from then, has to support this new codec. Well, why is this problematic? First, let's talk about a couple of things I find interesting on the codec. Number one, the AV1 codec is not supported by Google's Chromecast device, you know, their $35 streaming thing that they put out there to do everything. But number two, if you're not familiar, what is AV1? It's a new royalty-free video codec, emphasis on royalty-free because that's very important in this kind of thing. It is presumed to be the next de facto video standard, so much so it's backed by Google, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Samsung, Intel, Facebook, Arm, Hulu, and a variety of other companies. Why are these companies interested in AV1? Because it will save on bandwidth for streaming companies and customers. Basically, it makes it more efficient to stream things. Now, it does require hardware decode support on cheaper devices, such as a Roku box. Google wants to make AV1 a requirement for YouTube. That requires new chips that are more expensive than what Roku wants to put in these Roku devices. Now, we've seen how Fire TV sticks and Roku sticks can all be like 35 bucks. That's because the chips they are using are not exactly the most cutting edge or high powered chips. So Google's kind of forcing the hand here a little bit and being like, hey, if you want to keep using our services, you have to support this codec that's going to save us and anyone else that supports it a lot of costs because it cuts down on bandwidth, but is putting that cost, that added cost onto Roku here. So we have kind of an old fashioned standoff going here. And depending on which side of the fence you fall on, you may have different views. Some people are going, oh, this is an unfair requirement to levy on Roku. Other people are going, I just want to watch my YouTube TV on my devices. It's going to be very interesting. And as someone who sits in the cord cutter subreddits and the YouTube TV subreddits, I'm surprised to see it's kind of an even split as to who people are mad at. It's not like there's one definitive favorite on any of these subreddits. But I will say this, if I can no longer access YouTube content on my Roku, and I mean regular YouTube or YouTube TV, I will happily replace it with a Chromecast or a Fire TV Cube or something like that. Because as someone who has cut the cord to consume YouTube TV content, not having it is really a no-go for me. So I kind of salute Google's kind of F you to Roku right now. We're like, fine, we're going to bake it into the YouTube app, but it's not a long-term sustainable plan. So hopefully they come to some kind of agreement at some point here. You went into a lot of technical detail that I don't have with my own conundrum. And if you have listened to the Gunna Geek show for a while, you know what I'm about to say. But just because it's applicable here, I will state it. So I got really fed up with Apple over the past year and just went all in on Roku. I had to buy a new Roku device on a uh, device on a TV that had an Apple TV generation three, it was just wasn't cutting it anymore. So I bought a a new Roku device to to throw on there. And when I did over the holidays, I discovered that the Spectrum TV app was their contract was deleted from Roku in like mid-December. I want to say December 14th of 2020. So it's no longer there. Now, if you have the Spectrum app on your account, you can actually still add new devices to it, which I was pleasantly surprised because I was able to throw it on the new Roku device that I had. But you can no longer uh, download the Spectrum TV app on Roku. Now, there's pluses and minuses here. I get it. Roku's got to make some money, right? And on the other hand, Spectrum's saying our customers don't want to pay any more money, which is true, which is why I'm looking at cutting the cord this year, which still might happen. So... 
I, I get what's going on here. Roku has no revenue generation capability beyond the sale of the hardware and it's cheap. They just don't have enough money to pay for all this stuff that everybody's demanding payment for. So I, I just see this as a losing battle over time and Roku might go uh, away eventually. They've got market share right now, which is the thing they have going for them. But the thing that hurts them is they are not a content provider like many of these other folks mm -hmm. are. Like Roku doesn't provide content. Amazon makes sticks, streaming devices, also provides content. So there's guaranteed to always be something there. Google, content and devices and other Android TV devices that then license Android TV or Google TV on there. Apple, content and device. So Roku is the odd man looking out on the outside looking in. And this worked many years ago before people bought into streaming sticks, streaming devices, things like that. And Roku was able to get pretty favorable terms back then, too, because people weren't really buying into it and signed longer deals then because they wanted to get some cash out of Roku. Now it's time to pay the piper. And you're looking at these things and these guys are going, well, I have my own devices. I don't necessarily have to be on yours. Granted, Roku, I think, still has the best market share out of any of them. But if you're a company like Google or Apple, You've got what we'll call FU money here, which is, <laughs> okay, you don't want to car carry my content. I'll find an end around, or I'll just give everyone that's on, that is a subscriber to my service a free device so that they can continue to consume it. And then you don't have anyone on your platform. I don't think Roku's going anywhere, but I think these negotiations between them and content providers in general are going to get more and more contentious because they don't have a way to be like, well... Uh, we're, we won't give you this if you don't give us that because Google can be like, well, you don't get access to YouTube if you don't put our devices, have access to your content, things like that. I, I completely screwed up that analogy, but I think you guys get what I'm getting at here is they've all got something on each other to kind of force deals to happen. And Roku doesn't other than market share, which will continue to dwindle if they don't make deals. I'll say right now, I uh, I hope that this is the end of Roku. I, I legitimately do. I hope that we no longer have Roku in play because they. this is not the first time that we've been in this situation and it's bad for consumers. And I think objectively, if we were to look at what the demands are here, I think Google is pushing too hard with the AV1 requirement because it's a physical requirement that they also don't have a solution for their own hardware. Yes, I get that all of these other companies are pushing towards the AV1 codec, but we'll see when those companies actually go in and push that out because we know that there's Apple TVs, older Apple TVs that are being used by lots of the Apple profile. I highly doubt Apple will force users to upgrade to a current gen just to have that, that tech necessary for AV1. I, I highly doubt that. I think Apple will play it longer and have the different versions. Well, one thing to keep in mind, this is future proofing is their plan here. And just because devices that exist now don't support it doesn't mean it won't long term. And I'm sure they'll do dual support for an extended period of time. Yes. I think Google's intention here is to be like, we need you to move forward with this plan, because if you don't, that's what is Roku, 32 percent market share yeah. or whatever. So it doesn't use this advanced codec, which costs us a boatload of money. Apple I, I, did the dual support for a while for that generation three, but it's a, a piece of crap now. If yeah. you have to use it, you need to upgrade to the, what is essentially the four or the six because they replaced the five with the six. That's the, the options right now to use the devices in full functionality. But but my point here is that, like, obviously, this is Google pushing again for something that they cannot Roku cannot meet and they don't have this this. They're, they're under all of these situations that you just mentioned where they don't have any leverage and there's no ongoing revenue stream and whatever other than hardware. They don't. And we constantly have consumers losing support for apps or whatever where, where these terms are, be, are expiring. And I think that it's just putting consumers in a bad spot by having Roku as an option where this is this perpetual problem. SP is an example of that. He had a problem with Apple TV. He wasn't willing to wait, and he defaulted to Roku. I wish Roku wasn't an option for him because now that was, at the time, his best option, which this is another situation where potentially he could be affected. If Roku hadn't been an option at the time, he might have picked something else. 
But because Roku does things just, just so good when it's good, people often go to it as their fallback, like SP did. And I think that it would be great if they were gone because then people might put up with a few other problems, but maybe not have th- this level of perpetual apps leaving. So uh, I just I I I would like to see Roku gone. The the app issue you're going to see on all devices, and we saw it a little bit with HBO Max and Peacock rollout and things like that. This is just the new normal that we're going to have to get used to. Is when these deals run out. These companies are going to play hardball with each other. And the people that get screwed is the consumers in this regard. And sometimes they figure out these deals before contracts expire. Other times it's, well, we've seen it with cable TV. It's, well, you've lost access to these channels. Call your cable company and complain or call the content provider and complain because they're not giving us favorable rates. It's just cable on streaming boxes at this point. Well, I guess we'll see what happens in any case. um, At least... SP has one of the latest Rokus that he can continue on um, keeping us up to date with the latest happening as an actual Roku user because our diehard Roku fan did say in our chat that he did leave. Uh, That's right. Albert Sims for a long time was was our our go-to diehard Roku fan, but he did say he did dump his two Rokus during the HBO Max fiasco. So SP... You're you're holding down the fort for everybody now. And I bet you he'd have dumped it sooner if HBO said, hey, we're going to give you a free streaming box because Roku's playing hardball. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might come down to that with the free streaming boxes or at least apps on TVs. And, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. I, funny enough, for a birthday present today, I purchased one of the new or pre-ordered one of the new Apple TVs, not for me, but for a family member whose birthday is around now. So uh, we'll see what the generation six brings us. Well, I look forward to finding out what your experience is when you borrow that device and don't give it back. I I guarantee you, I will be setting it up. (laughs) All right, well, let's go to our last news point here, which is about this 15. That's right. Last week, I was able to watch this live, and I don't care how you pronounce it. If you want to pronounce it 15, that's fine. It stands for serial number 15. SpaceX's Starship SN15 prototype test flight and landing occurred last week on May 5th, 2021. Cheerios? Lucky Charms? What type of cereal? I prefer... Cheerios, personally. Honey Nut Cheerios. Yeah, I love Honey Nut Cheerios. They're great. Yeah, yeah. I I have the little single servings now because like, I can't get through an entire box before it goes (laughs) bad. It's more expensive, but at least you you don't waste any Cheerios. Okay. On May 5th, 2021, SpaceX successfully launched and landed the Starship SN15 three-engined prototype at their space base in Boca Chica, Texas. There's a drinking game. The on-crewed ship flew to an altitude of 10 kilometers, shut down all three rocket engines, belly flop, glided back to the launch facility, reignited the three engines to land vertically on the designated landing pad with two engines. The flight lasted approximately six minutes and the ship did not blow up afterwards. We'll get back to that. This was the first successful three-engine Starship prototype flight in Landing, I got a little annoyed at all the press coverage, even the space press coverage, saying this is the first successful space Starship SpaceX flight. No, there were other successful flights. This was the first successful three engine flights that included the belly glide and the landing. So get it right, guys. Anyway, uh, the Starhopper was the first. Let's just go through a list of what happened. The Starhopper was the first. It had some tethered flights. Then it had a series of two untethered, we'll call call them hops because they were just straight up and down. There was some translation uh, horizontally on July 25th, 2019 and July 27th, 2019. Then the next one was SN5. It was a single engine prototype that flew 150 meter hop on August 4th, 2020. SN6, also single engine prototype that flew 150 meter hop on September 3rd, 2020. The next flight model was SN8. It flew a three-engine prototype and flew to 12.5 kilometers, the highest of all of them so far on December 9th, 2020. It was on successful 
When it landed, there was low tank pressure resulting in insufficient thrust and a hard landing and thus a loss of vehicle. SN9 was also a three engine prototype that flew to 10 kilometers on February 2nd, 2021. It was successful until a engine thrust issue resulted in a hard landing and loss of vehicle. SN10 was a three engine prototype that flew to 10 kilometers on March 3rd, 2021. It was successful and actually landed. It was a hard landing. A low thrust caused the landing legs to crumple and SN10 was upright on the landing pad for roughly nine minutes before we saw that incredible explosion on the pad. SN11 was a three engine prototype that flew to 10 kilometers on March 30th, 2021. SN11 flew, flew successfully to 10 kilometers and then a small methane leak caused an engine failure upon reignition and quite frankly, explosion that none of us saw because it was shrouded in fog above the ground. Debris was found five miles away from the location of the mid area event. The next flight prototype was this one, SN-15. It was a new design iteration of the Starship, included a thinning of the stainless steel from 7 millimeters to 3 millimeters to reduce vehicle weight. SN-15 experienced a similar post-flight fire that SN-10 did. However, SN-15 was able to undergo safe procedures and prevented the loss of vehicle post-flight. SN-15 also landed more gently than SN-10, keeping two of the three Raptor engines thrusting through the landing for redundancy and gimbaled steerage. A SpaceX representative wrote in a statement, quote, SN-15 has vehicle improvements across structures, avionics, and softwares, and the engines that will allow more speed and efficiency through production and flight. Specifically, a new enhanced avionics suite, updated propellant architecture in the aft skirt, and a new Raptor engine design and configuration, unquote. SpaceX has not yet disclosed whether they will fly SN-15 again. SN-16 is nearing completion and has already been given the go-ahead for a test flight by the FAA, which we discussed last week along with SN-15 and SN-17. And currently, we have in production SN-15. 15 is flown, SN16 is being produced, SN17, then it skips 18 and 19, goes to SN20, which will be the first orbital version that will fly atop of BN3. That is the big booster number three. Guys, I, I think this was a success and kind of a failure all in one. I mean, it was great to see it go up, come back, not explode, but did it, did it was it really a success i mean you had a lot of fire afterwards there was a lot of fire i want to say right now that i don't believe that this deserved any of the kudos that it got um for for a success because of the fire like the only reason this got s such big fanfare and such big excitement is because the bloody thing didn't blow up if that's our, our baseline of where we get excited, we have a real problem here with what we're expecting as safe uh, and successful test flights. No, it caught on fire. Your fire suppression maybe was better this time. You were better prepared for the fire because you knew what happened in the previous fire. There's nothing to say that the fire was more in control or, or or was, sorry, there's nothing to say that the fire was more under control because of anything to do with the rocket. It very well could have well, been just the fact that they were better prepared. The, the fire, like you said, looked the same. If it was a flawless flight, then yes, absolute kudos. But there was a moment there where we were all watching, wondering if it was going to blow up. That's not a success. And and honestly, I'm annoyed with how much people have cheered about this quote success. There were live streams going on for the next day, I just know. Wait, wait, waiting for it to explode. Uh, I will qualify one thing: it did land lighter than SN10, meaning they had a successful reignition of not one but two Raptor engines, which they kept lit all the way to the bottom to provide enough thrust so it wouldn't crush the aft skirt and thus providing more of an avenue of additional fire uh, that led to the explosion. So there was a slight flight profile differentiation between the two that allowed for less wreckage, basically, when it came down. 
but I'm still wondering about leaks. I'm still wondering where that fire came from. SpaceX, to my knowledge, has not disclosed what has happened. The SN15, the last I checked today, was still on the landing area. And I think SpaceX is wondering what they're going to do with this thing. They did roll back SN5 and SN6 back, the successful flights, back to the uh, production area eventually. But there has been no movement right now of SN15. Chris, you haven't had a chance to say anything yet. Well, let me play devil's advocate here, Stephen. I I would argue it's a success, but not necessarily as much as people are crowing it as. Because anytime you can learn more than you did the last time and then fix things going forward, I would argue that's a success. So the fact it didn't blow up, yes, it caught on fire, but there is more they can learn and analyze because, you know, it didn't destroy itself. I would argue that's a win and that's progress moving forward. Not as much progress as many are trying to tout it as, I don't think, but I think we can learn from it as SpaceX can learn from it and we move on. So let, let I don't think it's as negative as Stephen was saying. I don't think it's as positive as many people are taking it. I think there's more we can learn, and I look at that as a good thing. Maybe it's because I watched too much Mythbusters <laughs> growing up, which was, even in failure, there's success. And the success here is we learn more about what the problem might be because we have more evidence on hand now. I will say that one of the conditions of the flight of the FAA was if anything happened during the flight that would and need adjustment of the safety protocols for the next flight that they would have to pause and and reevaluate the safety protocols. I think we're in that mode that they have to take a look at the safety protocols. Did they work? Did they not work? Are there others that need to come into play? Because if SN16 goes up, comes down, does the same thing. The leak or wherever the fire came from is just a little bit worse. That thing could explode on the pad again. And then you're dealing with a lot of debris flying everywhere. I mean, everybody's safe. Everybody's at a safe distance, but it, it's just a hack to go through the recovery process and try to figure out, like Chris was saying, what actually worked, what didn't work. You can actually see the wear and tear on the hardware, whereas if it explodes, it's like, well, was this caused by the explosion or was this caused by the, the just the flight and the wear and tear on the vehicle? So, yeah, we'll see when XN16 actually flies. Remember, Elon is on a deadline, a self-imposed deadline to fly BN3 into orbit on or about July 1st, 2020. He's trying to make that flight because he has now that lunar contract to land Starship on the moon in 2023. Does he still have it? I haven't said that he doesn't have it. Protest hasn't changed anything yet. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Well, let's see what happens next time. And yes, I would I would love a, a, a true success. But that's going to go ahead. <laughs> what, what would you define as a true dis- success, Stephen? I'm just wondering. Well, what, well, what would you? Uh, I would start with not being on fire. <laughs> that, that would be okay. one, one of them. <laughs> Basically, nothing went wrong is what I would say. Well, how can you tell if nothing went wrong? It, it might not be a physically manifested something that went wrong. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe they just decide that, okay, we're going to go two engines, but if we only reignite one and we provide enough thrust, then we can get down to the pad, but that's still a failure. But you don't know because they're not saying that they need two engines versus one engine at the reignite point. So I, I, I mean, okay, I agree. No fire. Good. But- well, no, you, you. You just changed the test parameters there because if if they went out and they did that and they said, we're not going to light two, we're going to light one, and they landed as one, then that would be, and there's no fire, that would be a success because they, they set out to do something and it went off successfully. Here they, they set up the two engines and I'm pretty sure they, they did not plan to have it catch on fire, thus it was a failure. So it's got to be the test parameters have to have nothing go wrong, whatever that is. Now, are there... Yeah, sorry, go That's ahead. what I'm saying is we don't know all the test parameters. Like on this test flight, we didn't know for sure that they were going to light two Raptors all the way to the ground. We thought they were just going to down select to one and they had two. Which, and again, fire. Fire is bad, but... <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Fire is bad, especially Thanks with Frankenstein's <laughs> monster. <laughs> but that's gonna go ahead and take us to the end of the show. If you don't like your rocket ships catching on fire, we would encourage you to come over to our Discord at gunnageek.com slash Discord and chat with us while we're 
not recording this show because we got a lot of great people over there. And I don't know, maybe you'll find some people there that are pro rocket fire. Come on to guinegeek.com slash discord and get in a brawl with them over there and debate whether rocket should be on fire or not on fire. Well, I guess it depends on if you want to see them explode or not. <laughs> Where's the fire? Don't you need it to launch? Oh, I like it. Uh, Chris Farrell, what would you like to plug or promote this week? Friendly reminder, we do stream a lot of content here. So if you're watching the show live right now on Geeks.Live, you can scroll down to the bottom of the page, see the calendar of upcoming live events. And if you're not watching live, head on over to Geeks.Live and scroll down and see that same calendar and go check out one of the other shows that streams on this channel. Aspie. I had the opportunity to be on an episode of a friend of the network, actually a network member, Josh Liston. He has a podcast about podcasting called Dead Set Podcasting. I was on an episode, actually a couple episodes now of it. Episode 63 started a three episode arc TV podcasting in 2021 and beyond with SP from Better Podcasting. That's another show that I do on the Gonna Geek Network. And uh, that was the first in three. And then he actually replayed some of the previous interviews that I did with him before on episode 62 prior to that. So there's going to be a total of, I guess, four episodes with me on Dead Set Podcasting. So you can go over to deadsetpodcasting.com and catch those episodes. So for episode number 376 of the official Gonna Geek show, I'm Stephen John Drew saying CSP. I controlled myself. I didn't make the joke. I'm SP saying I'm very proud of Steven for actually getting the episode number right. I'm Chris Farrell. Fire good. Bye. Thanks for checking out another episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always join us for our live recording sessions, which stream Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at www.geeks.live. And remember, you can find our full back catalog at gunnageek.com forward slash show. If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on gunnageeknetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week.